So how many want to vote for that one to replace the Stars Made of Matter? Anybody? You got one, two? Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. You can do that. You're welcome to sing that at the Michigan Stadium instead of the other song. And uh, just sing really loud. Um, so now we come to where it all begins, in uh, basically the mouth of Baltimore Harbor, where Fort McHenry stands guard, preventing the British fleet from coming into Baltimore, which had been the source of many of those privateers and marauders that had harassed the British fleet in the first year of the War of 1812. Um, basically, there was this other big war happening in Europe. There's this guy named Napoleon you may have heard of. Um, Napoleon sort of was keeping the, the real British military busy. Um, when they finally defeated Napoleon and the actual British Army showed up in the United States, things started to go rather badly for us. Um, when we were fighting the Canadians, we were pretty much even with them. We were, neither of us were that, uh, really that smart. We didn't have a very strong military at the time. Um, but when the battle-hardened troops from England showed up, uh, basically the, the tide of the battle turned very quickly and included the burning of Washington, Washington D.C. Um, not really the whole city, but just the federal building. So the idea was really to insult the country, to show the world how weak we were, and to, to hopefully sort of have a, a, an important sort of um, propaganda tool to be able to sue for peace relatively quickly um, to the advantage of the British. So their, their sort of final statement was going to be the capture of Baltimore, which they expected to go basically as easily as Washington, D.C., <coughs> which took about an hour to defeat the troops of Washington, D.C. They thought maybe two hours to handle Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore, however, was a much older and a much stronger city and had this rather large fort. They had been expecting the British for over a year. They had this rather large flag you may have heard about. It's uh, currently at the Smithsonian Institution, 30 by 42 feet, which was meant as a statement of defiance, as you will read in that poster right there, um, in our exhibit, talking about the history of that flag. And so this was already meant as a sort of a, a banner moment, if you will, that gives us our title today. Um, so, Key, you sort of know the story. Key sees the flag, writes the song, comes back a couple days later, gets it printed as a broadside, gives it to the, the defenders of Fort McHenry as sort of a thank you gift, leaves his own name off the imprint. Right? He doesn't take credit for writing the lyrics because he really wants the story to be about the defense of Fort McHenry, which is indeed the initial title of his poem. If that title had stuck, I don't think we'd be singing it today. So an important thing that happens is the publication of the very first sheet music imprint of the song, and he gets a friend, a guy named Thomas Carr, Episcopal organist at St. Paul's Church in Baltimore, which is also having a concert this afternoon. We're sort of the two places that are celebrating. Um, and they create the first sheet music edition, so the first time that the lyrics were written with the notes. It's erroneous to say that Key wrote a poem that someone else set to music. Key had written a previous song using exactly the same melody. We know that he knew it. It's also a very unusual um, rhyme scheme for this lyric because it has bombs bursting in air, rockets red glare, gave proof to the night that our flag was still there. there. So it has three rhymes in the course of those two lines, which make nine rhymes over the, the eight lines of the entire song. So you don't do that by accident. Um, write a, a lyric that has nine rhymes and eight lines. And so in this case, we know that Francis Scott Key knew the tune and that there's no way he would have done it by accident. And he went to his friend, the organist at the Episcopal Church. He, Francis Scott Key had considered a career himself in the ministry, but decided it didn't pay well enough because he had 11 kids and he had a family to support. Um, so there are a lot of descendants of Francis Scott Key. But anyway, um, he, he tells his friend, Tom, to write this, to put this melody to the tune, and he publishes that sheet music. It's the most valuable piece of sheet music in American history or in world history. The last time one was sold, it auctioned for half a million dollars. So it's right over there. Um, please leave it in the case. <laughs> but um, he made Cop Carr, you know, which was a commercial sheet music publisher, right, was not a nonprofit institution like the University of Michigan, had to make some money off this thing. He wasn't just doing it as a favor. He was thinking he could capitalize on the growing excitement of the country to this victory at Baltimore, which nobody expected, least of all Francis Scott Key, and thought that they would, would sell a lot of sheet music. However, if you title it in defense of Fort McHenry, which only people in Baltimore care about, you're not going to reach a very wide market. So they take the tune that's, or the words that are repeated in every one of the final couplets and make that the title of the song. And so this is the first time that the title Star Spangled Banner is put with the tune, so which is obviously a, a key moment, shall we say. Um, right now we're going to... Oh, uh, yeah. I've been doing this for a long time. I've got to get it out of my system. 
So tomorrow's gonna be an interesting day. I don't know if I'm gonna be elated or depressed or <laughs> um, We are right now gonna sing only the third verse. Um, it, is, it is an important verse because it actually expresses Key's disillusionment with his forebears in England, who he thought of as rather classy characters, as being rather educated and well-spoken. He studied their law, which he saw as a model for the world, of course. And instead, these ruffians show up and start burning his house to the ground. Not literally, but, but his White House and his Congress. He, he, of course, was a resident of Georgetown, so in some ways I consider him to be among the first Americans because he wasn't a member, wasn't a resident of the state of Maryland, he was a resident of the District of Columbia. So he's one of the first people who really sees his identity as tied to the nation rather than tied to one of the original 13 states, which is how most people saw themselves really at that time. So we're going to sing just the third verse because we're going to get to the other three of the, 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 the total of four um, at the end. But the reason this one is sung now instead of at the end is because our final version will be the service version, which was popular during World War I. In World War I, we had a rather friendly relationship with Britain that we still have today as sort of our main ally. And so this third verse, which sort of takes to task the band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion would burn this country, would take over the United States, right? The, the hiring and slave, which, which is the mercenaries from England, okay? So he's criticizing them, and we tend to sort of leave that one out now because it doesn't really function quite so well in our contemporary politics. Turn! 